Good evening, everyone. Once again, I tell you, it, the, the excitement never wears off. This is, I, I look forward to this show all week long and we work hard. We almost time our company to this strange Thursday night, <laughs> 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, you know, you kind of start it and how do you change it? Um, which is why we have the replays, which is good. Anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, as people are streaming in, it's gonna be a wonderful show. I'm gonna start with the honors right now and um, Let's get it on. So again, water's new gold and uh, the world's only vital scarce and recession proof market. And that is for sure, July 15th. And it is briefing number 119 for what that's worth. Um, and of course, recuerda puedes escuchar en español. You can listen in Spanish. On the bottom of your dialogue, there's um, a globe and you just select Spanish and you're in it. And I understand that we have some Spanish speaking people. So that's wonderful. I'm gonna adjust my, my microphone here a little bit. So it's a bit closer, there we go. All right, uh, safe harbor statement. Of course, you know the drill that um, we, we of course do our very best to tell you exactly how it is, but the actual eventual outcome may be different from what we say. All right, right away, I want to welcome the ambassadors, Philanthrope Investors Ambassadors. And um, our partner, Philanthrope Investors, is uh, amazing. Um, and it is, was founded by Ivan Ans right here. You can see his picture. And, um, you know, he, he built an amazing um, real estate play to help Americans buy homes they couldn't otherwise afford. They ended up number 87 on the 5,000. Um, and now he's doing it in water. So he's helping us tremendously. And um, Ivan and his CEO, Artie, and the VP of expansion, Vendi, have put together an ambassador program where you can be involved as an ambassador for Philanthro Investors, our partner in the US and in the world. All you need to do is email expansion at philanthroinvestors.com. So that is a word from our fantastic partner. I'm going to jump right into this thing about the second water revolution. Before you get to the second one, what was the first? And those of you who caught um, this morning's CEO update know a little bit about this, but let me talk a bit further. First of all, not everybody gets emails these days, so let me not assume. Um, the first revolution was really when people built huge systems. The best example was the New York City water supply, uh, what I used to call the Delaware um, system. And, uh, but it's actually much more than the Delaware River. It's um, um, the whole Catskills, the Cro uh, Croton watershed, and all delivering vast amounts of water to New York City. You, you can safely say that New York City would not exist today without this water system. It's amazing and uh, well protected also. They've, they've taken great care to keep these watersheds uh, a watershed being a source of water um, from being polluted and, and damaged. And they even have their own special police to make sure there's no <laughs> um, people putting LSD in the reservoir, that kind of thing. Um, and it started in 1837. Right now they're building tunnel number three, which has taken 50 years to build. Here's a picture of it. Um, and it's, it's an amazing feat of architecture. And once they build city tunnel number three, they can finally um, after I think 83 years, get back to fixing number two, number one. So it's quite a, quite a huge thing. And it's largely, of course, invisible. Here's the problem. New York is one of the very few places that has this going on. Because in this first revolution, you know, we had these massive water systems. But the problem is, is that we all kind of lost track. And starting in um, the, you know, really, you can see that the peak of federal funding was 1976. But in fact, the, the, um, the infrastructure projects started disappearing in 1960 onward. Um, and it's gone all the way down to less than 9% uh, of the um, budgets that these cities have. So it's no surprise that a city like Compton ended up with brown water because they just couldn't get the funding. So that's where we stand today. So, you know, what can we do? Well, we can't build big, right? And it, why? Well, think about it. For example, Fort Lauderdale has a, oh, no, I apologize. Um, Miami-Dade County 
which is a big, big sprawling county, was built without a lot of sewage. And so they have over 100,000 um, septic tanks um, in, this, in the county boundaries. And these are starting to cause big problems. Um, I'm not going to get into the problems, but, you know, poop in the yard, that kind of problem. And so the city, the county said, okay, we'll spend $6 billion. Well, first of all, you got to find the $6 billion. Number two, imagine trying to run sewage lines out to these, you know, incredibly distant, um, you know, individual rural or, or suburban residences. It's going to take 20 years, tear things up. And meanwhile, the problems go on. Well, the, the solution is to do it ourselves. For example, in that specific case, those septic tanks would be replaced by self-contained water treatment systems, and it'd be funded by uh, rebates much, much cheaper, perhaps one-tenth or less of that $6 billion budget. Anyway, the point I'm making is that self-reliance, the do-it-yourself movement in water is growing fast. And for us, we deal with that at the business level. Here's a couple slides from the the um, presentation we have on our website. But basically the idea is that if you build all these decentralized treatment plants, um, then a, that you can have a smaller central plant. And you've now made it less of a problem to have infrastructure um, investment. So that is decentralization and it's happening right now. What is one big reason for it? It's about the money. Why? Number one, they, um, the municipalities are charging more and more. So these, these companies, businesses would like to cut the cord by saying, you know, only sending treated water to the city, um, recycling treated water. So they don't have to pay for that more and more expensive. And finally, they don't have, they don't have to have a sewage line at all, which for example, this example of this dealership in Pennsylvania, uh, not far from where uh, Ken Berenger is based actually, um, they went ahead and used our system to relocate off the grid. And we're doing a lot of business with the mobile home parks, RV campgrounds, you name it, housing developments. You can now put a 200 home housing development on a hill somewhere far away from sewage and just have it be self-contained. So that's huge. Now, so our mission really is, as you know, to help businesses cut the cord and create something called total outsourced water. What is that? That's where the business does not have to pay up front. Let's imagine that you're a brewery and you've, the, the city says, no, you've got too much, um, too much beer effluent. Uh, we're not going to take it anymore. Um, and so you build your own system. And the problem with that is that breweries aren't typically funded to do water projects. They're typically in the business of making beer. So there's a lack of capital. I've spoken about this before. So we really are dedicated now to providing these machines. There's this brewery, all I have to do is sign a service contract, pay per gallon, just as if they were paying the city, but now they're paying us. We become a private utility. Okay, now, what does that mean? If we can accelerate adoption of water treatment at the business level, at the community level, we can take what is a $1 trillion industry and which is only treating a small percentage of the total uh, dirty water um, and grow it potentially as much as five times its size. Now, the question immediately is, um, can one company do it? I don't think so. So no single company can make all this massive change happen by itself, which is why we've designed water on demand to be independent of our own ability to um, treat water systems. At Origin Clear Corporate, of course, we, we, know, uh, we use our own brands, Modular Water Systems, Progressive Water, but if they get overwhelmed, we have other water companies that we are close to, that we're building strategic relationships with. And so as long as we're funding these things, we can get them done. That's great. But in addition, there's these big problems that I hear about all the time. Riggs, what are you doing about Flint, Michigan? You know, I was involved, uh, you saw the coverage last week about this big thing that I worked on in um, uh, 2019, which was, uh, you know, Compton, the brown water in Compton. And then we keep hearing about Fort Lauderdale's problems. And, and one thing that nobody hears much about is, you know, terrible toxic um, water in South Bend. Okay, well, we can't do anything about these because who's the customer? These things are typically unfunded or they are uh, of a nature that is just not our business. So we need to also put in place community action. I've been talking about that. 
Let me talk about something called a stack. As you know, I came out of high tech and we have this thing called a stack. In uh, the tech world, a tech stack is a combination of these technologies that basically layer on top of each other. So you start at the very bottom with the hardware, the metal as they call it, and you go up through the operating system, the database, the middleware, which is the connection between the database and the um, services like, um, let's say for example, you have Amazon, um, you know, uh, provides uh, a big database in the cloud, but then people run um, services off of that and they're connected by middleware. And then finally you have the user interface, which is what people see. All right, so that is kind of the, the layers you have to have to build what you might call an ecology. And this is the ecology of tech. And we are looking at doing a similar thing for water. Now, this is a very early and quick look that I'm giving you, but this is where our thoughts are going. At the very base of this water stack is what, we, what we're calling the crypto community layer. This is a, 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 a cryptocurrency that we're working on. And please don't take this as gospel because it's extraordinarily uh, sensitive with regulators. So we are not advertising we're doing this yet. This is totally being explored, but I can tell you that we're, expl we're exploring it very seriously. We meeting with lawyers and, um, and developers and it's it's a, a lot of my time lately has been spent on this what this is is uh, our vision of a of a coin of a cryptocurrency that's kind of that enables something called a dao decentralized autonomous organization that is something that exists to um, decide how money will be spent by this community it is not directly to help origin clear rather we see this as a as a a base layer for everything that's done in water uh, all over the world. Now, on top of it, there is something that we do and we want to do, which is what we call the crypto security layer. I've been talking to you about the ways to pay out dividends to investors using a, spe a specific kind of uh, coin. You, you might call it digital currency. I won't get into the terminology, but um, that very definitely is something we have in our plans. And it is less sensitive because it is clearly a security, meaning that you know, only what's called accredited investors are gonna be receiving that. The community layer, that's much more complicated and we cannot tell you that it's not gonna be a security. So again, uh, you have to think of that as being um, something we know has to exist. There needs to be something at the base layer. What the actual structure of it's gonna be we shall see. For example, we've discussed that perhaps this could be called the uh, the waterpreneur layer. Remember how we had uh, water as a career and water, uh, the water industry is aging out and it needs more people and maybe we've put people to work. So maybe that's a, um, a service, a water service layer, right? Water as a career. This is just to tell you that it's still very fluid, but it's happening very quickly. Now, on top of it, you have the services, i.e. managing these, these outsourced water systems. And then um, the, um, um, on top of it, the hardware, which is um, um, the hardware, which is, there looks like a few words got missed there in that, in that thing, but basically these are water treatment systems being used for the paper gallon model that we're talking about. And then of course, on top of that, you have to have the capital to fund these hardware and service layers. And on top of that, you have the companies like Origin Clear and potentially others um, who are doing this water as a service activity. So this, this is kind of what we see as the water, second water revolution. What we're enabling here is self-help um, by really everybody concerned. You know, at the very base level, this community, it's like everybody in the world can participate. That's our vision anyway. Second layer is this uh, interesting creation of a, um, um, a water marketplace perhaps with um, this digital currency, again, TBD to be determined. Um, and then, you know, the services being the, all that billing of for the paper gallon, the meters, the sensors and all that stuff, moving up into hardware that is specifically designed for this kind of activity. Remember that modular water systems is designed to be roll in, roll out. And so um, you can deliver it. And then if the customer stops paying, the pay per gallon 
contract that can be taken out. So it's a very specific layer for this do it, um, self reliant water treatment. Capital again is raised by these companies. We're doing it ourselves. We have a $20 million private placement specifically to fund the water on demand project. Um, and that money is in a special subsidiary uh, safeguarded in many ways and used only for these hardware uh, um, investments. And then finally, of course, uh, the, the, these new age companies of which Origin Clear is a leader. Now, water as a service is not new. In fact, I'm putting it in quotes. Why? Because it is a trademark of another company. But that other company did water as a service for very large projects like a desalination system for an entire island. Um, water as a service for smaller localized businesses is brand new. It's considered hard, right, to do because, you know, it's just as much trouble, but it's less money. So the large water companies are not really jumping into this, the, the, these, what I think is the real growth area and is proven by, by the trends. There's a tremendous growth going on. Um, and so it's the growing space and the, the old water companies don't want to play in it, which create, creates an opportunity for me, um, in my, my, my mind for us, that is. So uh, it, there's a very important book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And in that book, it, it traces the evolution of industries such as the disc drive industry or the um, um, dirt digging industry, you know, various different industries. And in each industry, the, the next player that destroyed the previous generation company, um, that previous generation company could not afford to do the next thing like the smaller disk drive because they wouldn't make as much money. And so literally they were destroyed by it. So what I think is gonna happen is we're gonna to move towards a shrinking of the big central water companies over time as, um, as infrastructure shrinks and a growth of these um, local water companies and they're getting more important. And this has been predicted as a trend by a global water intelligence, GWI, for uh, gosh, um, six, seven years now, they've been saying this is gonna happen. So that's what all I'm gonna get into on this, but you can tell that this, we need some, uh, we need a design and this is starting to come together and to make sense. And, and we can really um, honestly think of it as a revolution because I, nobody's been thinking about this to date. Um, it's because of our amazing investors and the team we have that we were able to persist through all the learning experiences we had, including that, that first crypto effort in 2018 that, was, that gave me nightmares for a long, long time. But, you know, um, you know, as they say, experience is a great teacher. It just sends in big bills. So we learned so much from that. And I think that makes us uniquely qualified for imagining and ultimately building this system. There's going to be much more on this. You're kind of getting a first look. It's very informal. And again, remember that we're not promising that there's going to be a particular kind of coins done. Um, I'm not even going to get into the terminology. <laughs> we'll just let it be for now. But that's how it is. And we'll be happy to discuss it further. Ken Berenger, whose name I will give to you shortly, um, uh, his contact info, is deeply involved with this. He was a um, uh, co-inventor on our H2O, dollar H2O coin. And he's very, very much up to speed on this. So stay tuned. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to move to some amazing stuff that's going on in uh, progressive water treatment. Uh, and Tom is here, my main man. Oh, yeah. Boom. Hey, do you see my hat? That's Michigan, baby. Pure Michigan right now. That's right. And my shirt is, of course, the Bucks. So what's a guy from Florida and Tampa doing up here in Michigan? And the truth is, I'm, I'm here for summer to see family, for my wife's family. But we did fly into Flint, Michigan mm -hmm. the other day. And, you know, your, your lead in so incredibly accurate. Because as we fly into Flint, Michigan, we get here off the plane. And we're, we're hungry, of course. And we're like, oh, let's go to dinner. And everybody's like, oh, no. You don't eat in Flint because of the water, <laughs> you know, it gets in the food. And it's like, I, it's so sad. Oh, that's terrible. For, for the you can't Flint. literally go to a restaurant. Yeah. It's just this continuing saga of pain and suffering for this community in that area. When you think about it 
And, you know, it, it brought me to just like research it too, just because, you know, we always hear about Flint's still broken, but Flint was fixed. Mm-hmm. But it's a separation of the two topics. And, you, and the people here on the ground gave me a much better understanding of what it means to have a Flint issue. So what happened was 2014-15 is the, the beginning of the Flint saga where the city essentially decided to, you know, save some budget. So they cut away from- Detroit. $500 a day. Yeah. That's what they saved. Yeah. And they were going to cut away from the city of Detroit water system where they were receiving their water, which was properly cleaned. And instead they tapped into the river, the Flint River, right? So the Flint River, unfortunately, they didn't properly treat that water, then provide it to the residents. So then not only was it laden with chemicals and metals and bacteria, but then also they added the additives to it, which are these chemical additives, which helped accelerate the corrosion of their corroded pipes. Now their corroded pipes were go all, dated back all the way to 1901 to 1920. So the pipes you're actually dealing with that were in the ground in Flint were actually that error that you just talked about. 1901. First was some of, and that's yeah. all over America, really. Iron pipes and cast iron pipes and stuff. So what happened with those, they corroded over time got full of lead, got full of bacteria and biofilms, which we've talked about in the past. And so now the city eventually switched back to Detroit water again, away from the river. So they've removed the water source problem. However, then that left them with the replacement problem. So they've gone through and literally gutted miles and miles of piping and replaced all the old piping with the PVC plastic oriented pipings. So now you've now new source water and you have new piping in the ground but yet the water's still bad in some areas because now you have the last mile issue of Mm. street to house and the actual houses are still old pipes, galvanized steel, you know, lead pipe, you know, all this other stuff. So it is the story that keeps on giving in this, this saga, which is an interesting, you know, point of time, but I thought it was worth, you know, looking at because it's so relevant to everything we keep talking about. So anyways, it's so happening. true. Well, it's amazing that you're there, actually, in, I am actually in, there. <laughs> in the eye of the storm, so to speak. But it's, it's uh, in many ways, water is worse off than people think. And they know it's bad, but it's worse. Yeah, yeah so, it's bad. So. And, and, and the real problem is that nobody's allocating money. For example, the Biden administration was proposing $110 billion. That's been cut to $55 billion, you know. And we think that roads, bridges, and broadband, you know, broadband access are more important than water. It's completely ridiculous. Those things are important, but if you don't have broadband access, you won't die. <laughs> yes, you can only last about three days without water. Exactly. So, you know, broadband I can do a month without. I'm all right. <laughs> well, wait a minute. What about Netflix? Come on. Dude. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so let's get on some great news. So the the team's really been working hard, and like we've had some wonderful updates the last couple uh, sessions where you know Dan Early and his team, you know, we're kicking it out of the park, and then obviously we've been continuing our efforts with the PWT team out of Texas and Mark Stevens and Mike Jenkins and the guys are just really uh, hitting their stride too. That We've just come off of a really interesting series of um, very heavy workload. Uh, we were just so busy from the beginning of the year till now with lots of projects moving through the pipe and out the door. Uh, we had a nice, uh, you know, finish on the Q2 there with uh, some of the projects that we were excited about. And what got real interesting is as we headed into the summer, you know, Mike Jenkins, our head of sales, which I think you have a photo of him, uh, is, you know, really been lining up a nice pipeline, really working the channels, people that we've worked with in the past, as well as, you know, some new opportunities that were coming in. And it's really, um, <laughs> we nailed it. Like we, we had some really strong proposals that turned into purchase orders. And uh, we're going to talk about it. Well, we have some specifics. First of all, we, I want to put some names, uh, some faces to the names. So uh, this, remember this uh, 2019 meeting, May Whoa. 2019. And- uh, <laughs> Oh my God, that was the best barbecue ever. Do you remember that? Mike got oh, that for us. so tasty. So <laughs> from left, we have Ken Berenger, who's uh, our VP of Business Development, Mark Stevens with the white hair. Um, and then of course, you, Tom, are digging in to that barbecue. Uh, Mike here, and then Dan Early. And that was the meeting where we, we did a lot of good planning on that, on that meeting. Um, and here is- here are the, the 
there he is terrible is mike, mike in the tan right. mike jenkins is is the man so he's our president of sales mm -hmm. there's mark stevens on the right in the blue and he's our president and general manager down in texas he's been running that business for 25 some odd years now i know mm -hmm. as as people may or may not know this was a father-son business his father actually had run the business uh, previous to him so they have well over 40 years at this location uh Amazing. just doing doing the stuff and, and that's, that's a lot of good. in in the, uh, the the deals they're doing are based on long term relationships. Yeah, really long term, and they go a long way because it's not just you know we have the commercial, we have the industrial, we have municipal, and then we deal with cities, you know, power plants, government agencies. There's a lot of you know various people, and the water industry is a you know an interesting cohort you know, base group where people know and they remember and they reach back out and they call Mike and they call Mark and go, hey, can, I, I really need this this piece of equipment and let's talk about it. And so, you know, sometimes we, we tee it up. It might take us a year, half a year, three months to kind of get proposals done. And then we get dropped in a purchase order. In this case, Mike, you know, has always been diligent following up with everybody on some work that we've done in the past over the years and uh, a reorder, so to speak from a, a good client. Well, here's our, in. here's our July, um, you know, um, high confidence. This is, there's a lot more of this, but um, uh, we're going to talk about the first two specifically in a moment, but there is, um, we're getting, you know, some interesting ag stuff um, and um, a lot of business, Progressive Water has always had a lot of power plant business. And yeah. then this, this pool preserve is something you've been working on for a long time. So that's interesting too. Yeah, that's that's a challenge, you know, to interesting industry dynamic because it's such a different end market, you know, with the, the customer base there, but great piece of equipment. So, so fun. I'm yeah. glad that it's not a hundred thousand dollars, but ninety nine ninety nine five. <laughs> I did that. I put that price in because I was like, I would go incentivize this thing to uh, the I gotta get it under hundred K. So I I threw it down there. I had to do it. <laughs> I wanted the well, deal. <laughs> let's get specifically into it. This is the latest PO. Um, and so this is uh, reverse osmosis, which is kind of like what they do is get, how do you get salt out of the water? You push it through mm -hmm. these, uh, it's a kind of a filter, but I don't want to get too deep into it. 150 gallons per minute, double pass. Now, what does yes. that mean, double pass? Uh, it means you push it through twice. So basically a uh, two pass means uh, you basically pass the water through the machine two times and you basically ultra purify it. So basically the first pass is kind of a, a roughing filter. And then the second pass is more of a polishing, you know, to get the, the nano filtration aspect. Yes. And um, this has gone relatively fast for, for these large systems. It started earlier this year. Uh, so they've been fast tracked. Uh, this is all going to happen beginning to end in one year, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, that was a really good one. A uh, very excellent example of what I would consider like the perfect order, right? If you want to think about bread and butter type work that is consistent for 25 years, actually, and the types of machines that we do really very well for commercial industrial clients, that is that is very accurately a perfect example of something we enjoy doing. Beautiful, beautiful. So then the other shockingly incredible one is this one. Ah, uh, yeah. Files, right? Yep. Power plants, uh, you know, are a big piece of our business. There's a lot to do there. So you know, when we get orders from them, you know, they, they have a lot of needs because they're doing industrial process, which means there's multiple stages of a water process they're trying to deal with. So in this one, we'll receive an order for multiple pieces of equipment. And so in this case, you'll get the ultra filtration compete, you'll get the reverse osmosis machine, there'll be an EDI, which is the electro, uh, you know, capability. Yeah. Yep. And you'll also, you know, we'll need some storage tanks. And then we put a nice sprung boost to you know, boost the, uh, the, boost the bronze. Yeah, boost exactly. The so, you know, when you add all that stuff up, they well, come together for a lovely price tag. Dun, 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 1.7 million, you and, know, but it's and that's just that. one of the sites, right? One of that the is correct. That's one of the locations and um, we'll be beginning on that one first. And then there's, there's three locations that need you know, similar yet slightly different equipment, you know, a little slightly different pricing between each of them. So we'll stage our way and phase our way through them. We'll, we'll begin one, we'll then be into designing and uh, building on one while we'll then start on, you know, some of the design on another one. And then we'll, you know, complete one, move on to the next one. So it'll just kind of roll its way along. Well, I want to put this in context because um, 
you know, Progressive Water for years now has done about a million dollars a quarter. Here we have over $2 million in uh, one month of, of predicted business. And there's more that's less sure, so we're not showing that. Um, and then on top of the modular water doing uh, over uh, almost a million dollars in June, and with a similar, I mean, I think we've had a change in our business. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's a there's a fundamental change in our business and doing business. Um, it's it's been very good. The market's been very positive towards us, and the truth is, this infrastructure stuff uh, coming down the pipe is important, and I think it's got people aware. Companies are putting the investment now. I think that maybe they're just going through a cycle where they're letting contracts as well. It's it's all happening at once. It's it's the perfect storm for us. Well, it, it takes us from about a four million dollar run rate to about a thirty million dollar run rate if you count modular water. Now, not to, again, I'm not making a formal forecast uh, because we've got an entire rest of year to go, and the for early part of the year was not that high. But we see a pop. And why do you think people are so urgent now, aside from just infrastructure being important? Well, I mean, there there is urgency in the sense of there's very few companies like ours who do the work that we do at the quality we do for these these end markets. Mm -hmm. And we're American. So, you know, there's been a change. COVID was an interesting change, plus some of the administration change where the Buy America by American made is a big piece of what people are trying to order. So you, you can only go to so many vendors for what we're doing and fabricator manufacturers. So we happen to be one of those groups and we have a proven track record. So that's plus. But the other thing is that there's an actual change taking place in infrastructure aging. And they just get to these moments in time where, you know, they I think they were holding out too long, maybe on some repair and replace. And they're, they're kind of, the time's up. You know, and I think COVID made it strained a little bit longer than it should have been. And now they've got to kind of do it. So, I, you know, it's, here it is. Let's take it. Let's go. <laughs> um, now there's supply chain issues and potential price increases going on. Is that a challenge? Yeah, it is a real challenge. There's, it's it's a real issue. It is no joke. I sent out an email to folks, you know, just talking to folks about order a little earlier, plan for some delays, getting things like basic pumps actually is taking longer than usual. Getting filters is taking longer. Steel prices went up, copper prices went up. Mm -hmm. These are real impacts. They are not short-term impacts either. These are, they're gonna be with us for a little while. Uh, we have to really be very good about our parts ordering and smart about making sure that we are, we communicate properly to our channel. And put deadlines on the P on the quotes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, we're doing the best we can on some things. We we've had a few situations where you know just complete real delays on a, on a, a couple things that normally wouldn't have been there before, and uh, we were surprised, you know. But it's impacting everybody. It's not just us. It's it's happening all over. Well, um, it is good news because we are we are um, this kind of new breed company. Uh, Paul Fetcher asks, are state or local governments required to buy American? And I think it's true. Uh, but we're not just talking about state and local governments here. We're talking about corporations, businesses. They too are starting to buy American, am I right? Yeah, they are. So, so it's a combination of buy American plus the ESG trend. So what happens is the buy American thing, you have that the federal government level, even you know Joe Biden's on television saying, hey, buy American. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that's not a, you, you can't force that. So where it gets forced, if you want to call it, is when they get into any kind of municipal uh, projects, right? Mm -hmm. Because when things go to bid or RFP, then they have preferred vendors or people who are allocated or okay to work with. You add now the ESG stuff, which we talked about, which is the environmental, social, and government governance topic. Mm -hmm. And this gets into governance issue of, did you buy American? Did you buy in a place which is a clean factory who doesn't pollute where they're making the equipment, right? Sure. Because what good is it to save like, you know, 10% by buying something in China, and then you just get a, a, a product back that's, you know, maybe it's okay, but it was made with slave labor or something that you didn't really want, right? You, sure. So you you have a lot of stuff like that, that's actually coming together for real. And, and, you know, driving this as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, uh, Tom, this is really great news. I know you've been working incredibly hard on this for years now. <laughs> well, so we've all been pushed, working on it. We've all done pushing it, that yeah. boulder. But no, but I mean, uh, the, the team is great, but I think also just sustained attention always pays off. So thank you very much. 
Well, I appreciate it. You know, like, you know, we we have a, a great company with some really good people here, and I really feel like we're we're getting momentum. As you know, like Dan came, you know, visited with us the other day, and he's excited. You know, it's like it's fun to see guys who've been working for you know decades, right, in the industry, actually motivated and excited, like about their own products and their opportunities, because that's a good telling thing, right? You know, that's not just something that's you know, hyperbole. It's that, you know, he's, he's feeling it, you know, he's got the, the juice. Like it's fun to talk to him. He's, he's motivated. So is, so the guys in Texas. It was a good meeting. My friend, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, let you go back to your family stuff in Michigan. Yeah, buddy. Uh, I really appreciate you jumping in. Have fun. Bye. All right. So, uh, that was wonderful. And so now I'm just going to wrap up with a couple other slides here. Um, sorry, I was going the wrong way. There we go. So um, again, remember that we have a current uh, placement that's going extremely well for to help develop the water on demand program. By this, I mean that we have to, for example, get very good at doing this um, water as a service stuff. It's a managed service, right? Well, Texas right now is set up to design and build, but not operate. So we got to get good at that. Uh, that means investment. Um, and of course, we need to develop um, these, uh, the billing systems and all that good stuff. So that is important to continue with. And it's a very good offering that's popular right now. And then there is this series V, which is <clears throat> people investing um, technically a million dollars, uh, although, you know, we're working on some flexibility with that, but, but it, it should not be, we're not going to have, you know, um, smaller investors in this because it's a more conservative play. Uh, it's not as high, um, a warrant leverage warrants is basically guaranteed future pricing. That's all that means. Um, but why is it important, um, uh, for more conservative, um, investors because of the, um, the senior creditor status that we are designing into this and a share of the net profits for up to 25 years, um, which adds up. As you saw uh, about a month ago, I showed the spreadsheet and a $20 million investment generates about half a billion dollars in revenues and proportionate net profits. So, um, and then with this digital currency, we have a way to potentially accelerate that payout for the investor. So he doesn't have to wait 25 years to be determined. Uh, but we're working on that and that is something that's very exciting. Ken Berenger has a few minutes in a day. He's one of the busy, he's the one arm paper hanger. He's amazing, working very hard. And um, you can schedule any time with him on oc.gold slash Ken. Um, and he will answer all your questions. Um, and finally, um, email at invest at originclear.com. Now, I didn't do a slide on this, but I wanted to mention that, you know, right now um, we are once again dealing with a delayed quarterly filing. Um, it is imminent that we will file, but because it was delayed, it's causing some uh, ripples out there in the trading world. And we, as you know, have, um, we recruited a very able CFO who is putting in processes to ensure that the, um, the Q2 one, which is due 15 August, very quickly after that, is not as delayed. So um, it is not something that's pleasant because it, um, well, it's just not great PR, let's put it that way. Um, but the filing is on its way. It will happen soon. And I, um, if you have any further questions, please email investedoriginclear.com and uh, Devin and myself will be happy to answer any further questions about it. Um, so next week, we're gonna cover the, uh, the Philanthrop Investor Ambassadors topic more. Uh, I covered it briefly at the beginning of this. It's a wonderful program of people who are bringing us um, a lot of um, you know, uh, really capital. I think it, if it weren't for Philanthrop Investors, we would not be able to build this $20 million capital fund. It's not to say that our own investors aren't gonna come in because we do have some coming in. But Ivan and his team really have the, the scope and the vision to make that happen. And there's no way you're going to do outsource water treatment without capital. And that's where this is at. And it will also lead one of these days, we think, to the NASDAQ. So that's it for tonight. Um, you know, I really appreciate you spending time with, with us. And um, Bob Bruce, I, I hope I gave a sufficient um, 
update, um, just to very specifically say that it's uh, looking like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it safe and say some, something like by the end of the month, but we're working on making it earlier than that. Um, the 23rd is a Friday. So sometime that following week is when I think it will happen. Again, um, I can't give guarantees, but it is happening. The, um, you know, Prasad is, is hard at work on it with uh, Eric and all the, uh, the rest of the team, Gwen, the auditors. And uh, what caused it was this extraordinary amount of creativity we got into, which was good for investors on all these offerings and exchanges, but it completely discombobulated our, our reporting process. I, it was it just you know, 18 simultaneous sets of preferred shares is a record. And so we are putting in the systems, software, top personnel, and it's not going to happen again on my watch. That's for sure. So thank you, Stephen Davis. Is uh, thank you, Riggs. Great meeting, and I appreciate you all coming. Let's have a great weekend. Do come next time, and I will be covering again these the Philanthropic Investor Ambassadors program further with our friends Ivan and Vendi, and maybe even Artie, the cool Artie Marin, who I've known for quite a few years. So thank you all, and have a good night. Mm -hmm.